Welcome, Ben Mama. Hello, everybody. It's Kieran I Care the Laird here, and I have a hardware review for you this week. And for those of you who follow me on uh, social media and um, Twitter in particular, uh, it's at Retro Laird. For those who don't follow me, I suggest you do because I'm awesome and I post loads of cool stuff. But there we go. Um, you will know that uh, just recently I've been lucky and after ages of not finding anything decent anywhere, I've managed to grab a few things um, locally, you know, um, from different places, Marketplace, uh, eBay, this one in particular, and uh, Sprock, actually. So all three of the kind of big uh, Marketplace sites, I've picked something different up off each of those, which is rather cool. And um, they will all be heading to... Uh, my channel for reviews at uh, different points in time. So yeah, I've I've been really lucky with some of my uh, bargainous pickups, and this was the first one of the three. And um, uh, in many ways, it's uh, kind of the most exciting because it's a system that I, I've not really had much experience with. I've played in them a few times at events. But I've certainly never owned one, and growing up, I never knew anyone who owned one either. So, it's um, you know, it, it's it's really cool indeed. And as you can already see, this is a Philips Video Pack G7000. And for those of you in uh, America and Canada, North America in general, you will no doubt recognise this console as the Magnavox Odyssey 2 because that's what it was called over there. And in fact, a kind of I think that's become the kind of more well-known name despite the fact it was actually known as the video pack in uh, the whole of Europe uh, where it sold better actually and that Philips were obviously a European company. And that's where the first interesting thing comes in because I'll just briefly go into a little bit of history on the um, on the video pack. So it's a contemporary to the Atari 2600. It was released to compete with it. It was one of the first consoles actually released to compete with the uh, Atari 2600 and was obviously designed and manufactured by Electronics Giant Philips. Now, it was released in Europe first in December 1978, so literally just in time for Christmas. And um, it didn't find its way to the US, actually, in North America until the year after. So it hit... Uh, US shelves in February 1979 as the Magnavox Odyssey 2 as we know uh, there was already the Magnavox Odyssey in America obviously which was the very very first uh, recognised games console designed by Ralph Baer uh, Ralph Baer also had a hand in the design of, of this unit too and um, Magnavox were basically uh, a US company that were owned by Philips so in, in, in the US because the Magnavox name was known Philips marketed uh, and sold all their stuff under Magnavox branding rather than Philips. Philips were extremely well known in Europe, though, um, by far one of the biggest electronics companies in Europe and, in fact, the world. Uh, the video pack was also released in um, Brazil, believe it or not, where it was actually very popular and sold very well. Apparently, it was the first kind of um, really successful console to be launched officially in Brazil. The Atari 2600 had been released there as well. But the thing with the Atari 2600 was that most of the ones in Brazil were actually uh, clone consoles and rip-off cartridges and everything like that. But there was an official release um, of the video pack in Brazil where it did very, very well officially with official cartridges, etc., etc. And there, in a kind of crossover, it was known as the Philips Odyssey. So they used the, the Philips branding and the Odyssey branding, so it kind of merged the two together. So we've got the Philips Video Pack, the Magnavox Odyssey 2, and the Philips Odyssey. Uh, rather strange. The system as well, another unique thing about the system is that the processor in it is an Intel 8048, which were mainly found in um, early computers. 
And obviously, this is the only console that I that, certainly that I know of anyway that used an Intel processor. So maybe it should have a little Intel Inside badge on it somewhere, eh? Um, whereas obviously most consoles and computers around that time were using either a Zilog Z80 or a uh, multi-roller 6502 uh, variant. <laughs> So let's have a look at the console in a bit more depth. Obviously, one of the first things that we should talk about, um, really, it is quite big, which is why I'm struggling to fit it on, on camera. It's a pretty hefty thing. I think looking at it, um, I should have maybe put one to the side. It's probably a similar size to the wood grain Atari 2600s, but it's certainly deeper. You can clearly see here the length um, of, of the system. It's probably about the same width. Um, it's probably about the same height, but it's certainly um, longer, certainly goes back longer than the, the 2600 does. And that's because it has this keyboard, which is a uh, a membrane touch keyboard, much like you saw on the Sinclair ZX81 and on the Atari 400. And this meant that you already see as well that Philips actually marketed it as a computer well, I wouldn't say rather than a console because they kind of marketed it as a computer, but also a console. So I suppose you could say it was the first hybrid that kind of tried to combine the two things together. Because, I mean, they clearly call it a video, video pack computer on there. And, of course, it does have the keyboard with functions and stuff like that. Letters, numbers, um, even things like plus, minus kind of mathematical functions there, uh, space bar, etc. But... This unit and, you know, that processor was, was nowhere really near uh, powerful enough to be, you know, a proper computer. And it certainly didn't have things like an operating system or basic um, built into it like you would expect to find on a computer. You could only load games and cartridges. You know, there wasn't really um, the add-ons of discs and tapes and stuff like that. However, in Europe, Philips did release a computer module, um, which are really rare and hard to find that you could add on to the video pack and that would turn it into a computer with Microsoft Basic. So therefore that keyboard suddenly became a bit more useful. And it also allowed you to connect a tape player up to the uh, to the unit to save and load your basic programs that you that you made. So there was, you know, that vision was there for it to be a full computer, but I say it only released in Europe really hard to find and goes for they go for silly money on ebay a couple of other interesting add-ons um released for it as well was a chess add-on uh which made it more a bit more powerful so it could play chess and there was also a speech module which is easily the most famous add-on for this system which gave it was the first console to have the ability to talk like that you know with the, the speech module um which is pretty cool if you have one i don't uh maybe something i'll look to pick up because uh, it is quite cool. I've, I've heard I've heard them when I've seen it at events. So let's have a look around the console. Obviously, we've seen the keyboard. This is our cartridge slot. I've just noticed that actually this is made in France, um, which is quite surprising. So I was kind of already almost assumed that it was built in the Netherlands because that's where Philips are from. Um, and they very famously had a big factory in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. So there's the cartridge slot. Pretty similar to a Atari 2600 cartridge slot. If we have a look at the cartridge, it has like actually a bit like Atari 2600 games. It has a sleeve that pushes back in into the cartridge and it goes in to kind of protect it. Um, like remember the old, uh, the original Atari 2600 games had that kind of flap that went across which pushed down and then the cartridge came out of them. So kind of similar but a slightly different design. And they all have these handles at the top to push them in, pull them out, which is quite cool. Gives it a slightly different look. Um, the Atari 2600 but we'll go into the games in a little while well let's have a more of a look at the units so at the back what have we got um nothing really the strange thing is it's a bit here that makes it look like uh it was certainly intended to have ports on the back and i'm guessing that 
these would have been controller one controller two and power supply i wouldn't be surprised but they obviously changed their minds with that because you'll see that this is this is the power cord here goes straight into the console and the, the power supply is inside it's not external there's an internal power supply and this is controller one and controller two they're hardwired to the system so if they broke the only way you could fix them was by obviously trying to replace the parts in the controller or by going inside and re obviously resoldering a new controller onto that board which is kind of annoying um, on the bottom, there isn't really anything, really. There's some feet and some screws, but uh, certainly nothing um, exciting. I can actually see a label on the inside there, though, with the serial number. Um, number 84065. You might just be able to see that on the camera there. It's in the um, Philips sticker. Strange it's inside and not on the outside. But there we go, that's all there is to show you. I mean, there's there's no ports on it anywhere, which is obviously really unusual. The only port is the cartridge port, and every, all the add-ons went into that slot. So your speech module and, and uh, the computer module, everything had to plug into that cartridge slot. That gave access to everything. So, as I mentioned, the power supply is built in and uh, the controllers are hardwired. So, let's have a look at those controllers. So, these are quite unique. It's another very unique thing about this system. So, I've got two of them here, obviously. The one of them looks in worse condition than the other. You can see the one on the right is um, really rusty and a bit creaky, whereas the one on the, the left is actually working a lot better and is in a lot better condition. Um, I'm not sure why. Uh, you'd expect the the player one controller to be the worst but it's actually the player two controller on my console maybe they were swapped around at some point who knows but anyway the weird thing is you can see obviously it's an analog controller it's not um a digital one like you know you get on the the 2600 so you, you have full 360 degree movement but you'll also see it's got these kind of notches that makes it like a kind of star so you can kind of move it into these notches, which obviously gives 16 di different directions. With your standard left, right, up, down, and your diagonals. So you can kind of lock it into place, which is quite unique. Um, very unique for the time. And then your action button is up here, as they call it, fire button, action button. So it's, it's not too bad to hold. It is a bit bulky, um, as you can see. Yeah, it, it's, it's probably no less comfortable to hold than the, than the Atari 2600 controller was. And probably a little bit more robust because you've got a metal shaft in there as well um so yeah these these are really unique um and they work quite well and some games used combination of keys as well um to, to operate them some of the more advanced games like they released some games based on like board games um where you had a board game as well as the cartridge which is another really unique thing about um video pack system i'm actually putting an image up of them in the corner so you can see so like treasure of time in and stuff like that so they 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 kind of combined board games with video games which was you know at really groundbreaking for the time and um was definitely a selling point of the system it was something they actually pushed heavily in the uh, the tv adverts for the video pack that they showed was with these these crossover games and they would have used the keyboard obviously quite a lot, but a lot of the games allow you to do things like enter your name, um, which is also obviously very cool for the time because that's something people would, would have done in arcades, but it was not something you could really do on home systems. But a lot of video pack games allowed you to type in your name before you started playing the game, which is another really cool thing about it.
So that's the controllers, that's the console. So um, I suppose we should have a look at some of the games too. And I'm gonna grab some of these and kind of line them up here um, because I've actually got quite a few of them. And um, one thing you will notice is, well, I can't get them to stand up. They just want to fall over probably because it's, they're at an angle. But one thing you will notice is, as I said, the box art is gorgeous on these. I mean, look at them. They're absolutely fantastic. That was quite funny though. It looks like he's constipated. The soldier on the front of that one. Um, what else we got? Um, here's another one there. I mean, look at that. That's absolutely lovely, that box art. I think the cowboy one is still my favourite. And I think it looks a little bit like Christopher Walken. Don't ask me why. Young version of Christopher Walken. So there we go. Actually, that one's the same game, isn't it? Oh. So I've got two of the same there. Oh, didn't actually notice that. I thought I had all different games. So I'm not sure how I've ended up with two of the same. But I have. I'll sell one. That's absolutely fine. So, yeah. that These are the games. And you'll notice that they're not titled by the game. All of them will just say a number. So, obviously, Philips Video Pack 14. Philips Video Pack 34. That one's 11. Um, I've got my one loose cartridge here, which is number 20. Um, that's number 30. So every game is numbered um, rather than having the title. And actually, to look at the title, you have to look down here. And it's in every language. So it obviously starts off by saying gunfighter, that's satellite attack. That one says battlefield. Um, some have more than one game on, though, um, like you know, some of the early 2600 games did and stuff. Laser War. Um, What's that one? Cosmic Conflict. So th these are the games, and obviously they have th the foreign titles underneath there. So that's where it tells you what what the game is. So that was really unique that they would say, you know, oh, Philly, Philly Pack 14, Philly Pack 34, not actually using the name of the actual game. Um, the back, there's nothing. These are, again, <laughs> I keep using the word unique, but there was so much that was unique about this console, even these packages. So in these plastic cases, I mean, I'm really surprised that these ones I've got are in such good condition because from looking at them these are exactly the kind of cases that you would expect to find absolutely smashed to shit when you buy them on eBay or marketplace or whatever because they've got these these plastic hinges that you know if anyone's owned a Dreamcast will know what a horrible decision using plastic hinges was because 90% of Dreamcast games you find are broken um, but inside there there's a lovely little tray that the that the games fit into absolutely perfectly so i absolutely love that these amazing cases and then the cover is also the instruction manual to see that um so you just take it out there's little grooves that it slides into and uh, there we go there's there's the cover and the instruction manual which is in a, pretty much every language because obviously they just use european manuals so english german french uh dutch and italian so they've kind of put every single language in there you know how to play the game etc etc um I, th I believe that obviously the north american versions the odyssey 2 versions obviously would have just been in english um so it probably would, wouldn't have had to be as big um because it probably wouldn't have to be in multiple languages oh and obviously it wouldn't need to have all the multiple languages on the front of the uh, odyssey 2 games as well but I absolutely love these boxes. I think they're great. One's got some sticker residue on, but I'm really surprised at the condition of them. Um, let's look looking at them. They've all got a lot of these stickers. I wonder if they were price labels on the side of them. Hmm. Who knows? I quite like seeing old price labels in games. They would have been quite nice for how much it cost. I just looked at that. Look. Uh, that actually says that it's Terrorhawks, and it's not. So I'm thinking that case was swapped over at some point because it's Laser War. Uh, because... Um, Oh, you can see there, laser wall. They can actually see through. So if they were stacked on a shelf like that, you could see what game they were. That's quite clever as well. Um, but that one obviously didn't have a hole, so stuck a sticker there. I'm guessing the case was flipped over because the guy who was selling this actually did have a Terra Hawks as well. Um, but I believe that game is quite sought after. And so he sold that separately, which was quite annoying because I wouldn't have minded grabbing that as well. Um... But when I saw this, he'd already agreed to sell the Terror Hawks to somebody. Uh, and I was kind of hoping that they weren't going to grab it, but they did. But there we go. 
I missed out on that. But I've still got a nice little selection of games here, so I'm pretty pleased um, with with what I've got. <laughs> So, my um, final opinions on the system then, really. So, the, the, the video pack, um, it's, it's a strange old system uh, that is quite obviously weaker than the, than the 2600. There's, um, you know, it has worse graphics, it has worse sound. Um, the games certainly aren't as good. It doesn't have all the recognisable titles that the, the 2600 had. Although there were some licensed games. I mean, Parker Brothers did some stuff for the video pack. So I think they did Frogger and Super Cobra and some games like that. And Imagic, believe it or not, did a few games for it as well. Like I think they did Demon Attack and um, Atlantis, certainly, for the system. So there are there are a few more well-known games apart from the stuff that Philips did. But, but not a huge amount. Uh, it does also, I should mention, actually have a pretty um, decent homebrew scene these days, especially over in the US. There's quite a lot of people who have made new games um, for the video pack. And Odyssey, actually, I was just thinking there's a European guy, uh, I think he is actually Dutch, who's made quite a few games for the, the video pack. Uh, Revival Studios, that's their name. I was trying to, trying to remember it now. I think he's made quite a few, few um, new video pack games. So yeah, the games are quite hit and miss. Some of them are really simple and um, get boring. Some of them are much more fun to play. One of the particular highlights of this system, actually, one of the most well-known games on it, um, which I don't have... Actually, I don't have either of the games I'm about to mention here, but one of them is Pickaxe Pete, which was uh, a really cool kind of little platform game. Used a lot of the advertising, and as I say, easily one of the most well-known and fun games for the system. Another really enjoyable game, which is certainly quite well known, is Casey Munchkin, because that was a Pac-Man clone. And the original version of Casey Munchkin, uh, when they released that, Atari sued Philips, and um, they had to make changes to the game to make it less like Pac-Man. Because uh, they Atari were quite annoyed that they had the exclusive rights for Pac-Man and didn't want anyone copying it. And they pretty much sued anyone who came up with their own version of Pac-Man at that time. So not really surprising. But again, uh, Casey Munchkin's one of the, the most famous games uh, for the system, along with uh, Pickaxe Pete and um, actually the ball games that I mentioned earlier, like Treasure of Timing. So yeah, uh, if you like, if you like, um, you know these really old systems like the the Atari Twenty Six Hundred and the Mattel Television, then you probably will get um, some enjoyment out of the Video Pack and Odyssey Two. If you find the Atari Twenty Six Hundred too simple for your tastes then you'll definitely find this more, you know, definitely not to your taste because this is less advanced than the Atari 2600. So, you you know, if you find that system uh, too simple, you're not going to get much enjoyment out of this. That said, I quite like the video pack. It's got a certain amount of charm. Um, I love the design. It admittedly isn't a system that I'm going to sit and play for a long time. There is only a few genuinely classic games available for it. But there's something very, very cool about the system. I think a lot of it is the aesthetics, the fact that it's so unique in its design with the controllers and everything like that. And, you know, I have to go back to it, but the amazing box art for the games as well that, you know, just really, really stands out. So if you collect your 8-bit systems, uh, then it's, it's probably worth getting one. I mean, I got all of this for £50, uh, which I think is great. And I think there's many systems that you can pick up for less than 50 pounds with a load of box games so you know they're obviously it's certainly over here in the the uk they're certainly quite cheap to pick up uh i did have a look on ebay after i picked mine up and they did seem to be going for a, quite a bit more on ebay actually i think i saw some similar lots to mine in the region of sort of 70 to 100 so um, but still pretty reasonable if you're getting a load of games with it so you know if you already own the other other consoles of that period, like the ColecoVision 2600 television, and want something a bit different and a bit more interesting, then 
then perhaps the video pack or Odyssey 2 is for you. So I thank you for watching my um, look at the video, Philips video pack. And uh, I will see you all again for another video very soon. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. If you enjoyed this review of the Philips video pack, then please make sure you go and check out my documentary on the ill-fated follow-up to the Philips video pack and Odyssey 2, the Magnavox Odyssey 3.